Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I talk with Harry Rosenholtz, who runs College Hockey Showcases. We talk about his experience coaching D1 hockey at Yale and Quinnipiac. Then Harry answers a ton of questions about the college recruiting process and how to plan for the summer recruiting season. Harry gives some great advice on how to reach out to coaches and what to do before and after events. So I hope you enjoy it. Before we get to today's amazing episode, I wanted to give you an update on Champs App. We now have over 80 college coaches with verified Champs App profiles, most of them from D1 schools, and we continue to add more coaches each week. Once you create your beautiful, free hockey resume on Champs App, you will have a personalized profile link to share with coaches and teams, or you can connect with team coaches directly within Champs App. Coaches not only learn more about you as a player, but they also get notified of your upcoming schedule, when you add videos, and where you are playing if you change teams. Just go to champs.app and click the sign up button to start or update your profile. If you want to learn more, look in the show notes for links to the list of college coaches using Champs App and videos about why and how to create your free Champs App hockey resume. I'm very excited to have on the podcast Harry Rosenholtz, Executive Director of College Hockey Showcases. Originally from Long Island, New York, Harry was an associate head coach at Yale and Quinnipiac for 12 years, and then the head coach of the Spanish U18 and senior national women's hockey teams. He now runs College Hockey Showcases and is an expert in the women's college hockey recruiting process. Welcome to the podcast, Harry. Thanks for having me, Ray. I really appreciate it. So, Harry, we're going to start off like we do all our guests, although I think yours might be slightly different, talking about their hockey history. And so I know you you were not the, you know, professional hockey player growing up. Um, so maybe just talk about how you um, got into hockey and um, how you ended up being a coach. Uh, very small history because uh, I was not very good. I grew up in Levittown, uh, New York, Levittown, Long Island. Uh, where there were basically two rinks in all of Long Island, or three rinks, at, when I was growing up. Uh, so we really didn't have a chance to do to do very much as far as development. Um, and uh, my family didn't have a whole lot of resources. So uh, I did a little club hockey here and there. I was a goalie. Um, basically, in those days, uh, uh, you know, I actually started before, before they had uh, plastic masks. If you can wow. believe that, wow. uh, that that ages the ja me. Jacques the Jacques Plante era, the Jacques Plante era. The, that's the, it. the Jacques Plante era. I can remember going to a little sports store in uh, in Levittown with my dad and saying, "Dad, I really need this. This is something that's really important to to protect me." And he said, "Well, it's thirteen dollars, and we can't afford it." So let me get this straight: your face is not worth thirteen dollars. Apparently, apparently. Okay. Well, yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. And so um, I believe you went to Case Western Reserve in Cleveland and played club hockey. Is that correct? Exactly right. Uh, it was, again, a low-level kind of club hockey thing, more for the beer than anything else. And oh. I succeeded. I was very successful at that. Gotcha. And, and, but in high school, before you went to Case Western, you were you were actually were a coach, right, in, in Little League. Is that correct? Oh, my God. How did you do all this? Yes. My uh, – I, I – was I've been a coach for as as much as I could possibly be a coach for most of my life. So and, and, and ha what what was it about you that you knew you wanted to be a coach at such a young age? I like helping kids, and I like being around kids who uh, are are trying to have some fun and learn things and uh, can experience uh, competitive sports. Gotcha, gotcha. So then, like after you graduated, you obviously got married, had a couple of kids, and then you correct me if I'm wrong, but how you got into hockey was coaching your two boys, and that that's really how you got the like passion for specifically around hockey. Uh, that coaching is correct. That. that is correct. I coached uh, my boys, I guess, for eight or nine years. Not only my boys, but other kids, and um, and thankfully, I I handed off my coaching uh, of my boys to other coaches. Yeah. Um, who did a better job and uh, but I was able to coach some of the other uh, some of the other kids and we had some some great success uh, with youth hockey on the boys oh. side well what was your biggest success in, in youth hockey on the boys side that uh, that that kind of you know tickled the fancy to keep you on going you know even at a higher level I think one year we beat uh, um, we beat uh, what was it uh, mid Fairfield which was a super highly ranked uh, team they had a uh, couple of kids at 
going to NHL, and they were they were stacked. All right, and we beat them two to one in the semifinal of the regional. Of, of, excuse me, of the state championship. All their parents had all their tickets punched already to go to Chicago, and uh, and we pulled off a two to one upset. Um, I'll never forget that. That was a lot of fun, and I can re also remember that Helen Rezor, who I ended up coaching at Yale, uh, was on the Mid Fairfield uh, uh, team, on the boys team, and was one of their better players. Nice, 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 excellent. So, what was it like coaching your kids, and how much did you enjoy coaching your kids, and how much did they enjoy being coached by you? Mm. Well, you know, there's two types of coaches I think that coach their kids. There's ones that where the kids can do no wrong. And then there's other coaches who probably have sort of the polar opposite attitude. I was somewhere in the middle, but more more towards the thing where, like, I was pretty demanding on my, my own kids, um, which is, as a memory, it was, uh, I think it all worked out. Uh, I think they've become outstanding human beings um, and uh, successful people, and that's kind of what it's all about. All right, gotcha. And how did your kids think about it when they look back on it? You know, I think they 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 ended up loving it. Um, you know, at the time, I think sometimes it was really hard for them because I was, you know, I was demanding not only on them but on their friends. And I think that's tough for kids to to have to be in that in that same room where where your dad is, you know, kind of kind of laying it out for some of these for some of the kids and calling kids out and stuff like that okay. so, any advice for for parents who might be listening to this podcast uh, about you know coaching their own kids yeah try not to do it as much as you possibly can <laughs> but um but it's also a great experience and it's you know it's a life lived together i mean we spent uh you know eight nine years being close and and being able to spend all those weekends and and drives and everything else so it's a great experience. Just understand, have perspective, understand that you're not going to win the Stanley Cup. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So um, so you have all this coaching experience. And so how did you end up at Yale as uh, their first volunteer uh, coach? <laughs> Crazy story. So um, this sort of coincided with my wife not be being sort of sick during that same time. So I was looking for an opportunity to get out of the situation that I was in. Uh, I, I had a, a business in New York City, and I wanted to be able to stay more local anyhow. Um, and one day, out of the blue, I get a call from John Marchetti, who was the head coach of, of Yale at that time and a, had been a very successful coach at Providence, Coach Cami Granado on the women's side and some of the other great Olympians, had won three in those days, they weren't national championships, but they were sort of uh, ECAC championships. Um, and he get, he gave me a call and said, hey, I hear you're a pretty good coach. Um, why don't you come uh, talk to me? We'll have a little interview. So I got I got there and uh, we talked about with their goalies. He said, you know what? I, I can't make this decision without my goalies, so I'm going to have my goalies talk to you. And if they like you, then we'll, then we'll take it to the next step. So it turns out we had a good talk with the goalies. They were good kids. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they went back to him and said, hey, we like this guy. He's okay. So Marchetti calls me into his office and says, hey, congratulations, you're hired. And I said, I said, great. What does that mean? And he said, yeah, you're my new volunteer assistant. So, you know, it's just somewhere. It was crazy. And it was just it, the timing was perfect um, for me. Um, so I ended up doing it. It was supposed to be like a, uh, literally like a one or two day a week kind of situation. It turned into a pretty much a full time thing. And, you know, I had been a scheduler and I had actually worked with some of the best female hockey players on the, you know, in Connecticut um, before. So, I mean, I knew all the great uh, players like Caitlin Cahow and Jen Cyphers and all these other really, really talented future Olympians. Um, and so it was a, a really kind of a natural transition, I think, uh, for me to start to, to deal with that. But I will say that when uh, we first started with, uh, with Yale, uh, we would get beat um, seven, we'd be down seven nothing after the first period to like Dartmouth. Okay, and I'd walk into the dressing room and literally the girls were sit, sit, standing there crying or sitting there crying. 
and they were pulling their hair out like, why am I doing this? Why, why do I put up with this? And because Yale in those days were really, really poor. Um, and uh, there was no real commitment, I don't think, from the university standpoint to, to, to get any better. So when we got there, when I first got there, literally, I think we hadn't beaten uh, uh, Harvard in 18 years or 20 years or something like that. We hadn't beaten Brown. Cornell, I think, had a 34-game winning streak against Yale. Um, it, just to give you an idea, that's just the Ivy League. Yep, and then they've come a long way since then, uh, considering sure how have. well they did uh, this past yeah. year in the top five. Yeah, so um, so uh, I, I do want to get into the recruiting side of things, which basically sure. relates to how you solve the issue of uh, getting beaten bad so 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 often. Um, but before we do that, I do want to keep on the technical side of things around being the goaltender coach. So, like, what is it that you know you do as a goaltender coach to help them, help them improve, and and how do you know what a good goalie is and you know what where they need to improve because you know that's a little bit foreign to me as as someone who's only played as a, as a as a skater. So that's a really great question, and it's a really important question for goalies to understand when they're being recruited. Uh, I think I think coaches look for kids who are naturally competitive, um, who 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 really hate even giving up goals during practice. Uh, I think that's one of the first things that a good goalie coach recognizes. I'm talking about on the recruiting side. I'll tell you a little bit more on the technical side in, in, a, in a half a second. But um, I think that's something that the coaches look for, athleticism, ability to track pucks, uh, understanding about where the threats are coming from so that they can um, uh, move rebounds out of, the, you know, out of danger, uh, all those kinds of things are actually sort of an intellectual property of goaltenders um, that I think uh, that I think is very helpful for kids to understand as they're developing it. Gotcha. And so how, how, how do you how do you help them like work on those things? You know, you just my philosophy was always just to, to I didn't want to take a, a, a kid and put him into a system. All right. I wanted to get that kid to be the best goalie they could be with their tools. Um, so it's just, you know, uh, refining, uh, working on certain uh, aspects of technical things. You know, in these days, they, you know, they use the, 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 the RVG things and stuff like that. Um, but in those days, it was really just working on some technical stuff. We introduced video. So we did a lot of video uh, work with the goalies so they could see what the, what the issues were, where their weaknesses and more, where their position was. Um, the other thing is, in those days, you know, the glove position is va was vastly different than it is today. You know, in those days, goalies hold, held their glove low. I can't. Really, I guess I can show it to you that way, right? They kind of held it low. It was. It was a thing. You'd have these great sa saves. So, but today, of course, the goalies have. Ha you know, are sort of almost uniformly uh, ha have their glove facing the the puck. Um, so there are some technical advantages, some uh, t advances, I should say, that, that happened uh, fairly recently. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. We think we covered more than enough on the, on the goaltender side of things. So how did that then translate into um, you getting on the recruiting trail? Obviously, you talked about knowing a lot of the top players in Connecticut and probably New York. Um, you know, how, how did you then, you know, become the the, you know, real recruiting master at Yale to, to help improve the record over several years. So here's, here's just, this is the way luck happens or, or, or freaks, freak accidents happen. That year, for whatever reason, the, that first year that I was there, Yale, uh, the admissions department at Yale basically shut down every single recruit that Coach Marchetti had put up. Um, uh, you know, so ba so basically, there was virtually n no one that they were prepared to accept that was on, on coaches' list. This is for the academic reasons, is that correct? Yeah, for for academic reasons. Yeah, most you know. Um, so I, I I went to coach and I said, "Hey, coach, you know what? Get me on the road. Put me out on the road, and um, uh, and I'll I'll find us some kids, right?" So he said, well, in order to do that, we've got to pay you to become a, a paid uh, recruiting assistant. So they just, I had a meeting with the athletic di director. They ended up paying me a thousand bucks, which nice. was huge, right? So luckily, 
<laughs> Luckily, I had friends in hockey from all over North America. And a lot of the, I, I put the word out, a lot of coaches contacted me and said, Harry, there's this kid here, there's a kid there. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have a, a friend up in Edmonton, uh, Alberta. And there are two, there were two girls there, Nicole Symington and Erin Duggan, um, who were really top players, had been uh, communicating regularly with Dartmouth. Um, and I made every, I basically pitched a tent outside their house. Okay. Um, literally. And it was like, you know, I, I did everything that I possibly could to, to, to get them there. And sure enough, luckily they both committed to, to coming to Yale and they were the, the foundation for what we were able to do in the next few years. Um, and, and how was that? Is that because you said like, hey, you get to come and play with these two players and, and talk talent, recruits talk talent type of thing? No, I told them, I told them that they were going to be the leaders, that they were going to be the, the kids that had to be partners in the recruiting process with me, that they were going to be the hosts of the kids coming in because these guys were real hockey players. Yeah, no, I was referring to because of them, you were able to use them as the anchors to bring in other players. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. In fact, Nicole Simonton, um, who was captain of this Edmonton Rebels team, which was a great, great hockey team back then, um, she she basically came because I embraced that uh, role for her, or she embraced that role for herself, I should say. But she really took it to heart, and she became the leader. Every single recruit that walked through our doors in the next five years or four years after that Basically, uh, uh, Nicole had everything to do with it. Beautiful. So. All right. So I, I, I want to get to the recruiting process, but I want to still like kind of uh, fun uh, history. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Through. Uh, so how did you end up at Quinnipiac, and how is recruiting at a scholarship school different than an Ivy League school? Oh, incredible! Incredible difference. Mind blowing difference. I actually um, had met with Jack McDonald, who was the uh, athletic director of uh, of Quinnipiac. Uh, and I interviewed with him for for the head coaching job, I don't know, maybe six years into my stay at Yale. Um, and what, what that meant was we walked on a field together, and Jack pointed up to this hill uh, on at Quinnipiac and said, one day we're going to have this great arena up there, and... You know, and and we're looking for that guy who can take us and, and lead us, you know, it, when we build that arena. And I said, well, I don't know if I have all that kind of patience <laughs> to, to, to wait for that. So I so I never really pursued that uh, with, with Jack at that time. And sure enough, uh, they did build that rink. It was like four or five years later. Fabulous place. Um, and then I got recruited to uh, come to, to uh, coach uh to coach there um i turned down the offer four times um and then i finally uh, accepted it um and yeah the difference between recruiting at uh, at a scholarship school and the, the difference at yale is is enormous so just to give you some idea it, with yale the admissions department was completely independent of the um of the recruiting of the athletic department and so was the financial aid department we really weren't allowed to have any conversations with those guys uh, as far as you know hey can you help us out that kind of thing well the exact opposite was true when i got to um it, it, in fact it was so much so that it was it was mind-blowing um so yeah it was a much much easier recruiting environment to say the least Gotcha. And then from a hockey perspective, was anything different? Well, again, we faced, when we first got there, we faced a lot of cultural issues. For whatever reason, uh, the culture at Quinnipiac was was not a good one when we had gotten there. We had a bunch of good kids, uh, but for some reason it didn't click. So, uh, and I think there was a lot of anger and disappointment from the standpoint of, you know, these these were kids who were going to, uh, who were playing at Northford Ice Arena and they were going to be leaving just before or at, at, after the first year of playing at this new new arena. So there was a little bitterness and a little bit of that going on. Um, but, uh, you know, but the kids at Quinnipiac were awesome. They're, they're awesome people. So um, uh, it was, it, it, we, we, our first year, we really struggled. 
And we ended up being three and 26 in our first year, um, which was pretty much par for the course for Quinnipiac at that point. But by the middle of the year, we had started to get close in games. We had recruited uh, a very good young player named Heather Hughes, who won Rookie of the Year in the ECAC that year. Um, but basically, it was really the beginning to to sort of at the end of the year we were we were like one goal away from winning uh, a bunch of games, so it was tight. The next year, we were fortunate enough to bring in uh, uh, Victoria Vigilani, who is a goalie. Who great who, last name for a goalie. She was great. I can remember walking around Yale with her as a, on a tour. Um, and, uh, it, it never really happened for her that way, but, uh, I happened to go up to a tournament in, in Ontario, uh, and, and, and saw her play again and said, you're my kid. All right. And she came in, in her first year, she had a nine, six, one goals against average before the playoff. She ended up with nine fifty, but a nine, six, one, which was better than Nora Rati that year. All right. And literally she put the team on her back. Um, and, uh, we had, we turned around, we were 19 and 10 that next year. So it was the biggest single turnaround in NCAA history at wow. that point. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, today they're doing awesome under Cassie, who's been on the uh, podcast with Brent and Amanda. They're doing a, they had a phenomenal last couple of years. So they had great support there. They've got great people. It's a great school. It's a great atmosphere. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things, uh, to, to sell at that, at that university. Yeah. And of course the men's side won the national championship a couple months ago. So, uh, yeah, that so so that, well, that, and that that's also too. part of it. They have that relationship with the men's side, you know, yeah. where, where they are, the women are, have always been treated equally as far as I, I could tell. And yeah. that's, that's hugely important on the recruiting side. Absolutely. If you, have, if you can say that to recruits, well, you're going to have the same, uh, resources, that the men's team has, okay, there's a lot of schools that you really can't say that, but at Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac you can. Yes, so. you mentioned Michigan is one of those schools, so um, that's a perfect <laughs> example. So, all right, uh, so we, we need to keep moving forward. Talk about yeah. your work with the Spanish national team um, and uh, how you got involved in that and um, what that experience was like. This was a great joy for me. Um, I uh, have this camp that I do in Sweden, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and, uh, it's been, it's been a great camp. This is our seventh year doing it. Well, well, during one of the years that we, we were there, I guess I was doing some drills and working with some kids and there was a Spanish parent there and, and he came up to me and said, Hey, you know what? We just lost our head coach who was a Swedish guy. Um, would you consider becoming our, the head coach of the Spanish national team? And I said, well, I'll, I certainly would have a conversation about it. And we had this talk, and literally within within two weeks, I was hired as the head coach for both the under eighteen and the the senior national team. Beautiful, yeah. and obviously, then you now have a lot of connections to Europe, which we'll we'll talk about in, in a few moments. So, uh, one last question, just about kind of your background. Um, so, you you've been recruiting for years and years and years, and met thousands of uh, female hockey players. How many letters of recommendation have you written? Oh, tons. Tons. In fact, I have to say that one of the things I'm most proud of is writing these letters of recommendation for medical school and for law school. And I think I have a perfect track record. Like literally, I think I'm like 27 and 0, right. which is which is pretty good. So basically, you're you're soliciting now parents to ask you to write letters letters of recommendation for kids you've never met for for them to get into med school and law school. Probably that, that not, but yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, let's move on to the recruiting process since you're you're really a, a guru in this whole area. So let's start with the most obvious question, which is how has recruiting changed in the last 25 years? Yikes. Well, um, the game has changed, right? The, and the female game is is really at a great point right now where it's it, it has credibility and it's growing and there's a lot of money and it's really a it's really become a, a, a great thing. Um the recruiting game has changed in some ways, in some ways it hasn't. But I would say, that, you know, I can tell you just to give you, just to go back to 25 years, my, in, in, my, in those days, we would go to three tournaments as recruiters, basically. Three tournaments a year. They were massive tournaments. Um, and we would do all of our recruiting in those three, three, or, three or four tournaments. 
What okay. time of year were those, were those tournaments? Just curious. So there was um, there was the hockey night in Boston was actually a, a, a big tournament in those days. So that was in the summer. Uh, and then there was a tournament up in um, uh, in in Ontario. I'm trying to think of it. Might have been Brampton okay. yeah. uh, or Mississauga. In those days, had a had a, a pretty big tournament. That was a Christmas time. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the other major tournament in those days. There really weren't many. Maybe so. Minnesota or Michigan or something like that. Uh, Minnesota. They, they didn't have any major like recruiting events in those days. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was before Minnesota became a, an NCAA team. I got you. Yeah. yeah. They were a little bit later on. All right. So um, let, let's bring it fast forward to today. Um, you're seeing what's going on with some of the top five teams uh, picking off uh, players from other teams, the top players on other teams. Um, you know, what, what's your impression on what's going on in the transfer portal today and specifically around the impact on the incoming, you know, 2024, 2025, 2026 classes and how, to, how they should be thinking about things because they're seeing that at the top schools, they may not be getting nice time because those are going to transfer top player transfers from other schools yeah well look i'm old school okay so i and i i'm admittedly old school so it's a little bit distressing to me in certain ways that uh that this is what's what's happened now with women's hockey because it never used to be that way um and i place a lot of, of emphasis on loyalty and on commitment i think those are values that as coaches and people uh, involved with women's hockey that we do need to teach but I also do understand that the that a, a top player who's who is uh, on a on a kind of not winning team or a team where they really have no opportunity to get to the to the to the promised land, why they would start to look at other uh, opportunities to to play for the big four or big five kinds of schools. Um, how is it impacting things? Uh, it's it have it's having a major impact. It's have you know I think that today kids when they're getting recruited they're they're already thinking about where they might transfer to. This is something I never even thought would happen. Um, but literally, I've had conversations with girls now and their families that are saying, "Okay, well, we'll go there for a year and then we'll transfer." Yikes! And, and I, I you know obviously I. It, it's it's astonishing to me, and I kind of would advise against that kind of mentality. So interesting, interesting. Okay, well let let's start then with um, you know taking off the real detailed recruiting process right. around self evaluation because if if there's a player and they don't know if they want to go D one or D three or and and like how to even start the process, maybe let's just talk about how players can actually see where they might fit um, and and how they can do that. Well, I think they have to um, they have to start to figure out which kinds of tournaments and showcases they can that they belong at, um, and that's a, that is a challenge. I think at first you have to kind of uh, play the field a little bit, but then pretty quickly these days you kind of have to narrow it down to the to the ones that are going to give you the best bang for your buck. Um, so how, how, how do you know? Like you know, so let, let's say you're in a market. Um, let me like like somewhere in Massachusetts, right? And so there's tons of you know AAA female hockey players. How do you know how good you are relative to your peers, just even locally? Yeah, no. It's, let's put it this way: today, to play D1 hockey, you have to be not only the best player on your team or the the best player on your top line. Let's put it that way, because a lot there are a lot of teams that have a lot of very good players. Um, but you have to be among the top players on, on your team. If you're if you're a fourth line player on a good team, um, chances of you getting picked up for D one are going to be pretty slim. All right, so you have to be you have to be realistic about that. Uh, I I think um, uh, in in Canada, for instance, I always tell kids, well, if you're not on the provincial team, okay, chance of you getting a scholarship. To come across the border is is slim to none. At, if at the minimum, you know, in most cases today, you have to be one of the better players on your provincial team. Not every kid on a provincial team gets a scholarship to come to the U.S. In fact, I would say that percentage has has diminished over the years. Okay, and part of that is because of the influx of international players. Okay, and that's going to continue, especially because of players like Naira. 
you know, from Slo Slovakia who turned the world on, on their ear during the last world championship. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of international players now uh, doing really developing really well, and now coming to the U.S. or or Canada to to continue their development. So, how do you know? How do you know realistically where you stand? It's hard. It's it's hard because you, you don't. Eat, sometimes the co the the club coaches they're not fully aware of where you belong either. Yeah. So you know, it doesn't hurt to to speak to someone like me and say, "Hey, can you take a look at my video? Can you let me know where you think I stand?" that kind of thing. And I get a lot of video like that. And I'm happy to help kids just sort of start to target the right market for themselves. I think that's where it's, the action really is. Gotcha. And then then the reverse side of things is how, how do players start to figure out which schools to target? Like what, what's the rubric of attributes that to factor in into that decision of like, here are the five to 10 schools that, that I might be interested in? Right. So there's, you have to start a matrix. Okay, and you have to start, you know, to, to, to see where everything comes together for you academically, socially, uh, geographically, demographically, you have to start this sort of uh, chart and see which ones have the, the kind of commonality. All right, and, and are in within your reach as far as uh, uh, being recruited. So look, if you're a high-end D3 player, it's perfectly okay to also include some D1 schools and try to, to get there if that's what you want, okay? But if but if for most of the kids today, it's really important to make sure you have all of those boxes checked off um, so that you can really target those schools. I'm sure that in, in other discussions you've had with coaches, almost every coach tells you that they are most interested in the kids that are truly interested in them and in their school, all right? So the more you can uh, demonstrate to these coaches that you have done your homework about their school and, that, that, and their hockey program, and you, you have specific reasons for wanting to go to that school, the more chance for success you have. Perfect. So um, related to that is, um, you know, if, if you're on Shattuck St. Mary's, you know, you're getting seen all the time everywhere you go. But if let's just say, you know, you're on the Anaheim Lady Ducks, you know, you're, you're not getting seen as often. Obviously, they do travel a lot and go to different tournaments. Right. But how, how do you manage the fact that maybe you're on a team that doesn't have, vis you know, a lot of visibility, but you are that top player on the, that number one line? Social media. Social media today is the great equalizer in some respects. And I think you can, you have to be very creative about how you use social media. Um, but as a player, I would think that if you can show certain aspects of your game on social media, uh, on Instagram, not on TikTok, <laughs> but if, I think if you can show, uh, you know, certain aspects of, of your game, um, that can be very appealing to, to coaches. Either they will follow up or you can follow up with them. Um, that way, I think that's probably the the the, the best equalizer that you you have. And yeah, now I'll put in a plug for a champs app. That if you put video on your champs app profile, oh, yeah, and exactly. connect directly to that coach, they can watch your videos directly through that connection. So that was my next statement. All right, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that endorsement. All right. Um, now talking about let's talk about how to reach out to coaches. Um, you know, email versus phone call versus these days text or maybe even you know social media direct messages. Um, how, how do you figure out the right mix of way to to reach out and and to get them to respond if they're allowed to respond? You know, uh, in 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 some form of communication back. So the first thing you have to know is when to start the process. And really, it it even though coaches in Division One cannot respond to you until after tenth grade. You need to start to, in best case scenario, you need to start to communicate uh, with coaches early. And by that, I mean probably at the beginning of ninth grade, maybe even at the beginning of eighth grade. And I still believe in email. I think email is important. I think you can put uh, a, a very creative sort of email together. Um, I think you can put a, a, a hockey resume uh, together. You don't, you don't have to go all the way back to third grade. But I think you can put a current hockey resume together, a little bit of video with some music on it. Um, and I think those things get to the coaches. You have to find a way in that email to stand out from the crowd because coaches get 150, 200 emails a week sometimes. All right. So how, how do you distinguish yourself 
uh, right away through an email. So, but I do recommend that you, you start the conversation through through email. All right. Then, of course, Instagram. You can follow coaches, have them follow you back, or they might be following you, and you can sort of uh, connect with them that way. That's very, very helpful and very important as well. Gotcha. And how do you respond to the? How, how do you think about the situation where the, the coaches don't respond back to you? Um, some I know are just really conservative, and they don't want to do anything until the June fifteenth date, and don't want to communicate at all, other than maybe send a uh, like uh, an email saying to fill out their recruiting um, questionnaire. But yep. um, you know, even after that June fifteenth date of of the uh, the, the junior year, um, is is that you know, if you're not getting any response, how do you think about that? Right. So this is tomorrow, right? June fifteenth is tomorrow. Yeah, and did this just so folks know this is coming this, out, uh, you know, uh, a little exactly. after June fifteenth. But uh, keep going. Yeah. Right. So yes. So there's going to be a lot of kids who are disappointed, and they might not get calls on June fifteenth. They might get calls later on, June seventeenth, June eighteenth, if 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 at all. Okay. I always used to tell kids, don't panic if you don't get a call on June fifteenth. Or, or in those days, July 1st, okay? I, I, when I was a recruiter, I never liked to, co to call that very first day. And the reason for that is all the coaches are calling that first day. You just get lost in, the, in the, the mix that way. I always used to delay it. And in those days, you were allowed to let them know that you were going to call them later in the week. You can't do that anymore. But I would say, don't panic if you haven't gotten any kind of uh, communication from the coach for the first week to ten days. After that, I think it's. It, it, I think the marketplace is starting to talk to you, right? So if you haven't gotten any significant kind of communication from a coach that you really want to to have that relationship with, after the first ten days, two weeks, it's it's time to start thinking about other options. Gotcha. Okay, and so basically. You know, expand your list of, of teams that you might be interested in and uh, yeah. maybe even D3 and things like that. Well, gotcha. I mean, D1 coaches, they have a list of maybe 50 kids, right, um, uh, that they start to comb through. And the ones who aren't interested in them, they move on to the next one. Well, guess what, kids? You have to do kind of the same thing. You have to have your A list, your B list, and and even your C list. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. I, I need to move on to so that we can still cover a couple more areas, but let's get into the summer events. So it's summer uh, recruiting events. What, what What is your summer event strategy? Like how many events? So I, I was, uh, just the other day I was looking at, uh, you know, different champs at profiles and people, some, some players have put in their schedules. I see some are going to three events. I some, see some that are going to five events. I see some that are going to eight events. They're going to like four tournaments and four showcases. What's your right. perspective on the number of events and how to think about which ones to go to? So here's the way you have to think about it. What coaches want to see is improvement. They want to see a trajectory of your development over time. Okay. Obviously, if you're, you know, if this is after 10th grade, your time, your timeline is a little bit tighter to, to, to demonstrate that. But in general, for the younger players, what coaches are looking for is the trajectory. They want to see kids that are committed, that are dedicated, that are really going to continue their growth as a hockey player. When I was a, a recruiter for college, I always recruited kids that I thought were going to be great in their third year. All right. A lot of schools today, they want a, a, what I call a, a, a Polaroid. They want a snapshot of a kid that's going to help them immediately because they have those needs. Okay. But I think... Uh, there are some coaches that are a lot of coaches that are still looking for that long term development. So the more you can demonstrate that over time, the better off you are. I guess what I'm saying is don't overexpose yourself. You want to be you want to get exposure in those events where you feel that you're playing your best or that you're showing your best. OK, sometimes uh, kids end up going to uh, events where there's a lot of very talented kids. And it's you know, super high-end uh, recruiting environment. And they get lost in the sauce. Sometimes it's better, I think, to go to a, a, a showcase or an event where maybe the level isn't quite as high and you stand out. Mm -hmm. Because that's something that the coaches will, will remember. Gotcha. All right. So, you know, there's different types of events, like I said, like tournaments, showcases, development camps. So uh, each one is slightly different. So sure. what, what should a player do before, during, and after event in order to make sure that the coaches recognize who they are other than just connecting with them on Champs app? So like, let's say they're going to a showcase. They know which coaches are going to be there. 
Right. Um, you know, what, what should they do? Definitely try to connect with them either through email, Instagram, let them know what your schedule looks like uh, during that tournament. But also do the, do the big ask, okay? And the big ask is, hey, when can I have a follow-up with you? All right, when can I have a, a Zoom call with you? Um, you know, you have to put yourself out there and ask for that kind of uh, uh, follow-up. I think that's super helpful. Most kids don't do it. I would say 95% of the kids do not do that. But I would definitely say, I'm going to follow up with you this, you know, on this week. Um, you know, give them a date. And uh, what, you know, I'd love to have a Zoom call with you during this week. When can we set that up? And, and how do the coaches react to that? Because, you know, just my experience is you can just get a wide spectrum of how coaches, you know, feel uh, comfortable being put on the spot. So, like, what's your impression on, on how coaches react to that kind of thing? I think that's going to be true of any kind of recruiting thing. Coaches are all different, and they all have different attitudes about it. Um, a lot of them don't want to be put on the spot. A lot of them are uh, more willing to sort of uh, help the kids along, even if they're not at the top level of their recruiting uh, profile. But I would say, look, I think the coaches in women's hockey in general are awesome. They're awesome people. I mean, why do the, why do coach why do people go into coaching women's hockey to begin with, right? It's because they're really good people that want to help these kids along. So I think in, in almost all the cases, they're going to be generous with their information. They're going to help you. That's who they are. Yeah, for some of the top teams that really get bombarded because everybody wants to go play for those super top teams or top universities, um, it's hard for them to respond to every every player. So understand, understand that going in. You may not get a response from one of those guys. That's just yeah. the way it is. Uh, anecdotally, I would actually say the opposite is actually I find that the top teams are really the top teams because they do respond. Um, and, and even if they know they have no, uh, you know, the player is, it doesn't have a choice. I, yeah. I just see, I, I see it firsthand because I see, you know, um, you know, how many connections some of these coaches have uh, on Champs app. And so the, I see the top coaches and the top teams actually, you know, making sure that they, they, the, every kid feels special and, and still remains positive on their school. I think, I think today good coaches do respond and that's how they build their teams. That's how they exactly. become top teams. So exactly. those coaches who have done that, right, that's part of their history. They're not going to change. Gotcha. And anything different about where you don't know which coaches are showing up to an event? Um, you know, like, uh, um, you know, there's the Beantown, for example, at, you know, at the end of the summer. You don't know which coaches are going to be there. I mean, obviously, every New England um, Division Three coach is going to be there. But you don't know which uh, head coaches or associate coaches for Division One are going to be there. Just stay the course. You pick – you're still the buyer. Okay, you're still the shopper here as a recruiter, as a recruit, all right? You, you're the one who gets to pick which school ultimately that you, you're going to go to, all right? So stay the course. Go with the, the schools that you want to communicate with, okay? Don't, the, the, don't get distracted. Don't try to get to everywhere. If, they, if, if the coaches happen to see you at a bean town or someplace like that and they like you and they want to follow up with you, okay, great. But I would say pick your eight to ten schools, your target schools, and and just really work those schools. Perfect. All right, and and make sure that those are appropriate for your level of play. And, exactly. And That's and the nature. Make sure it's all good. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So now related to this, why is the CHS Sweden Girls High Performance Camp so important? It's a miracle. It's been a little bit of a miracle camp. Okay. We started. I used to go to to, to Sweden as a recruiter. I did it for eleven years on my own. So I built a lot of relationships with a lot of people in Sweden and in Europe that way. Um, but here's the, here's the miracle. We have kids from 25 countries or more this year. We'll have kids from 25 countries coming to that camp. Many of them are referred to the camp through their federations, through their top, through their federation people. So these are some of the top kids in Europe, in, in, in everywhere, right? including North America. We get a lot of kids from Canada and the U.S. Um, so it's, it's the only true high-performance camp that lasts for two weeks. All right, so it's actually a development camp. We really focus on development. We have unbelievable skills instructors there. And this year, we're going to have 16, 14 to 16 Division I schools who are coming over, co coaches who will be on the ice with the kids. They get to spend... Uh, a, a solid week with them, all right? And here's the, here's the secret sauce. They get to have lunch with them. 
They get to have dinner with them. They get to know them on and off the ice. It's it's just a remarkable thing. And the result is we've had more than 115 kids in the last four years get scholarships to to, to play in the NCAA. Wow. And, and, and just so folks can understand, what's the ratio of player to coach uh, at, at this event? So we have, let, let's say we have 14 uh, uh uh, Division one colleges will probably have seventy five to eighty five kids. So oh, it's two weeks. That's a lot yeah, of uh, FaceTime. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and correct me if I'm wrong. Like it, this isn't about playing games and stuff. This is about getting better over the course of the two weeks. That's always been my. That's what pushes me as a as a as a person involved with women's hockey is I want to help develop the game. All right. So I'm not afraid to have kids from Slovenia come to the camp. Who, who may at first not be as, as as strong as some of the other players, but by the end of the second week, they're, they're right in there. They're right in the mix, all right? So I love that development piece. I think that's super, uh, it's super important to me, um, and I want to continue to do that. Beautiful. And, and you, you know, some of the coaches that are going there are some pretty big names, like Tara Watchorn, who's now the head coach at BC, and you've got, uh, you know, other Ivy League school well, coaches coming. coming. We've got Minnesota coming. We've got some... But, but all the schools that are there, they all have bought into my philosophy, which is to, they're there to help those kids improve um, and to get to know them. And I think one of the great things is because they are able to spend so much time with them, it demystifies the process. They, they feel comfortable talking to the coaches. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really helpful. Beautiful. And then you also have another event later in the summer. Maybe you just want to talk about that as well. Yeah, there's a there's an, uh, a a thing in St. Louis. We do our St. Louis Gateway Showcase, which is has been really really good for the last uh, uh, two years. This is our third year doing it. It's in the middle of the country. It, uh, everything is relatively inexpensive. The hotels are good. Um, what we do there is we have a very high coach to player ratio. All of our events, we like to have the best. Uh, coach to player ratio that we possibly can. So for instance, we'll have like 20 uh, uh, colleges at uh, in St. Louis. We might have 85 to 95 players, maybe 85 to 100 players. So the kids get genuine looks. It's not, the, and, and we also do social events. So the th same thing we do in Florida where we have an ice cream social with the kids and the coaches where they get to communicate with each other. They get to demystify this process and learn firsthand from the coaches that they, that they want to communicate with, um, you know, what they're all about. Perfect. All right. So uh, one last question. I wanted to cover it a little bit earlier, but maybe it relates to, you know, the, the, the Swedish uh, high performance camp is uh, the use of video. Cause I love using video. I do it all the time with uh, trying to figure out, you know, like, why is this player successful? Why isn't this player successful? Um, this kind of thing. Talk about the use of video um, and, and how to think about it as a player or a parent. Yeah. I mean, the more that you can get video breakdowns, you know, there are companies today that uh, that can actually get your video broken down for you, where they take a whole game and they'll just take every one of your shifts or goalies where they get every kind of uh, uh, puck touch and, and any kind of uh, a reasonable shot. That's really, really helpful to the coaches. Of course, those services are also open to the coaches. So if you do go to an event that has, that features one of those uh, video breakdown uh, if things you yeah, should mention that. That. Yeah. yeah you should mention that when you're talking to the to the coaches or writing to the coaches you should say yeah I'm on this uh, on this thing but also a lot of those um, video breakdown things have historical uh, things so that if things that you might not even know have been videotaped and broken down are on those sites yeah or you may not want to, to have seen uh, so uh, who knows uh, What's yeah, you know, maybe, you know, from four years ago when, when, you know, you didn't know how to play hockey as well as you do now. That kind but of that's thing. trajectory, right? Then you I, can... uh, amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. So last two questions. Uh, first, any advice that you have for players or parents as they go through the summer recruiting season? Well, look, it's going to be a roller coaster for most kids. Um, I would say try to be as realistic as you possibly can. Talk to experts like me. Um, there are others. But talk to people that genuinely care about the, the success and the uh, uh, and the placement of kids uh, in, in schools. My philosophy has always been to help kids go to places where they can be happy and they can be successful. All right. But in general, it's going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be times when things click 
Um, and there's going to be times when it's dead, you know, where, where, where there's, uh, uh, there's just no communication whatsoever. Understand that going in. Gotcha. And then, so then leads into the last question. If folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to find you? Obviously you got a website and an email address. So uh, maybe share some of that stuff with folks. Okay. Well, I appreciate that very much. So my, the website is college hockey showcases.com. Um, you can write to me, just use my name, Harry Rosenholtz, R-O-S-E-N-H-O-L-T-Z, T-Z in Canada, at gmail.com. Um, and I answer every email. Uh, so I'm happy to kind of do that and uh, and give you some guidance and uh, and tell you what I think uh, you might be needing to do to, 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 to get noticed. Perfect. And I'll include some of that information in the show notes so uh, folks can easily just copy and paste that info if they need it. Um, sure. Beautiful. Well, Harry, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It was great learning about your your history as a coach and then uh, obviously a huge amount of information on on how to handle the recruiting process and then obviously learning more about college hockey showcases. So thank yeah, you so you're much great. for having us. What you're doing on the podcast and what you're doing uh, with your app is amazing. So just keep it up. Awesome. Thank you, Harry. I really want to thank Harry for coming on the podcast. He shared some great insights about the women's college hockey recruiting process and how to figure out which schools to target and events to attend. You can connect with Harry on the College Hockey Showcase website or via email. Links are in the show notes.